The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Can American democracy survive the incredible divisions laid bare over the past few years? Can democracies the world over persist if such a crisis can befall the United States? Tonight, a joint TVO Toronto Star initiative called The Democracy Agenda Begins. We'll debate the prospects for overcoming the deep divides and treacherous terrain that make the democratic project a fragile yet resilient work in progress that doesn't happen by accident. Then, our Ontario hubs examine virtual efforts to resolve landlord-tenant disputes. And for the Agenda's Week in Review, we revisit our conversation about reconciliation here in Canada. It's Friday, January 22nd, and that's ahead on the Agenda. In his inaugural address, Joe Biden declared, this is democracy's day. The will of the people has been heard. The will of the people has been heeded. Democracy has prevailed. Tonight, we begin a new joint TVO Toronto Star initiative, exploring Western society's commitment to the democratic process. And to kick off this series, we're looking to our Southern neighbors and the daunting task they face to mend the frayed democratic fabric of their country. Joining us for this first installment of the Democracy Agenda. In Washington, D.C., David Frum, staff writer at The Atlantic and author most recently of Trumpocalypse, Restoring American Democracy. Also in D.C., Edward Keenan, the Toronto Star's Washington correspondent. And in New York City, Michelle Moody Adams, political philosopher at Columbia University. And Michelle, we're delighted to welcome you to the program for the first time. David, good to see you again. And Edward, we're very excited about this new initiative with the Star, so thanks for joining us this evening as well. We do want to start with the man at the center of yesterday's action. And for once, we're not talking about Donald Trump. We're talking about the new president, the 46th POTUS, Joe Biden. Here's from his inaugural reaching out to the millions of Americans who dispute the fact that he won the election fair and square. Sheldon, roll it if you would. I know speaking of unity can sound to some like a foolish fantasy these days. I know the forces that divide us are deep and they are real. But I also know they are not new. Our history has been a constant struggle between the American ideal, that we're all are created equal, and the harsh, ugly reality that racism, nativism, fear, demonization have long torn us apart. The battle is perennial, and victory is never assured. History, faith, and reason show the way, the way of unity. We can see each other not as adversaries, but as neighbors. We can treat each other with dignity and respect. We can join forces Stop the shouting and lower the temperature. David, to you first. It's considered a good day in politics when a politician has a message that meets the historical requirements of the moment. On that metric, how well did Joe Biden do? Um, th this whole event, uh, the, the, the transition, the inauguration and after, I mean, it's all taking place in the shadow of the heinous attack on the Capitol on uh, the 6th. 6th of January, and uh, it is all framed by the um, stark, startling absence of one of the central participants in this uh, transition, and that is the outgoing president. The, the role of ex-president is also a role in American life. It's also a duty. It comes with a lot of benefits, a huge salary, a big travel uh, package, office space, and there are responsibilities that go with it. Donald Trump's refusal to do the responsibilities of the ex-president was the other half of the story that Joe Biden was telling. And how well did Mr. Biden do, in your view? Um, I, I, he, um, he, he, by being there, did it all. Um, that is, that the, the very act of, of insisting on continuity in the face of this attack on continuity, that is what delivered the message of the day. Michelle, your view on how well Mr. Biden hit the notes he needed to on that day? I think he did extraordinary well. It wasn't just on that day. It was also the days before, particularly the commemoration 
of the 400,000 lives lost in the pandemic. The, there's commonality in acknowledging shared suffering and acknowledging that we need to do something as a, as a nation about responding to that suffering. And I think he hit just the right notes with that ceremony um, and with reminding us that the next challenge really is to address the pandemic. That's first on the list. And I couldn't help but notice that uh, even Chris Wallace from Fox TV said it was the best inaugural address he'd ever heard. From your vantage point, how did it hit you? Um, I, I think it, as, as well as he could under the circumstances, right? And the circumstances are difficult. There's, as he said, overlapping crises with COVID, with the uh, civil unrest over the last year. And then of course the democratic crisis, which was really symbolized by that unique nature of that inauguration where, you know, he had dignitaries, a few thousand directly in front of him, but beyond that, the mall was empty, uh, except for armed soldiers and high fences. And so, you know, he's making a call for unity uh, at the same time as he's talking about addressing economic and public health crises. Uh, but the, the sort of democratic crisis, the one that requires unity, uh, you, the inauguration itself demonstrated how difficult that's going to be to achieve. I think the speech he gave, you know, made the effort to start that process, but it's it's not going to be easy. For sure. Let's pursue that a bit, because I know there has been a, a great uh, excitement about a return to so-called normalcy in Washington, D.C. There was a lot of excitement about Amanda Gorman, who was... Uh, it, you know, fantastic. She was just extraordinary, exhorting Americans to imagine a new dawn. Uh, but let's quote from David Brooks in the New York Times, who reminded us recently that there was an attempt at insurrection on the Capitol. And he writes, there are dark specters running through our nation, beasts with shaggy manes and feral teeth. They have the stench of know-nothingism, the hot blood of the lynchers, and they ride the winds of nihilistic fury. Now, David, pick that up if you would. In your view, how much can Joe Biden's message resonate with the so-called know-nothing crowd of lynchers? Well, this may be the great Achilles heel of his approach. By emphasizing unity uh, as the theme, by saying that word so often, Biden made his um, work hostage to his opponents. Um, and in fact, the country does not need unity and probably shouldn't seek it uh, because the, the goal of, of seeking unity allows people, and you're seeing this today, that the, the cynical and the obstructionist and the people who are sympathetic to the insurrectionists say, Bi what is Biden's plan to make me less wicked? <laughs> you think, you know, his job is not to change you. His job is to protect the country from you. And so the um, the project here has to begin with uh, with acknowledgement of the danger and the difficulty the United States faces. But the problem that the United States has had for the past decade is that American institutions have always tended to favor um, the rural minority, the more conservative parts of the country. Um, in the past decade, that those parts have become more desperate and more fearful of challenges to their power, and so more willing to do extreme things, culminating in the attack of January 6th to defend their power. Um, so the way that you stabilize democracy is, yes, some people, the, the more marginal elements of the anti-democratic coalition, need an exit ramp and a way back to the country. But the country also needs to protect itself from the hardcore. Fox News isn't going away. Fox News isn't going to be mollified. Fox News and, and, and the forces it speaks to, that they exist as challenges to American political stability. Um, and so Biden is going to need a plan that doesn't make success hostage to the worst elements in American society. I did spend, Michelle, a lot of time on the 20th during the inauguration wondering, the 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump, what are they thinking about this moment here? And do they feel as if this new president is speaking to them? What are your thoughts on that? I actually think that group of 74 million people is a lot more heterogeneous than some commentators want to acknowledge. There is the hardcore, the QAnon people who are not going to listen to reason ever. But there is a sizable percentage, I actually know some of them, of people there who want to hear arguments about why the way they came to see the world might well be wrong, and in fact, in many respects, is wrong. If I were Joe Biden, I would actually sit down with the heads of media companies. I'd sit down with Mark Zuckerberg, I'd sit down with folks from Twitter, and I'd say, what can we do with these mechanisms we have for allowing people to communicate with each other, either in a local 
community or on a national stage, what could we do that would be a public service to help reshape the way people talk to each other around crises, but also around everyday small issues? We used to have in the U.S. Um, requirements that local stations had to have a certain amount of public service programming. Those requirements may still be there, but they're not taken seriously. And you could have dialogues around issues. You could have citizen assemblies created where people took a local problem and they had to learn the policy issues. They had to figure out how to solve it or just let them sit down together, get a policeman and somebody who's been in jail, put them down in a room together, talking to each other about how they see the world. What are the challenges they face? What might they have in common? Joe Biden can't do that alone. That's got to be a national project, and it has to involve people uh, at the local level, national level, sitting down, changing the way we talk to each other. And I do wonder how big tech would react to that. Uh, w one might hope that they'd react positively, but they could just as easily react by saying, look, we run private businesses and we don't need government regulating or telling us what to do. What do you think? Well, I think they probably would uh, react in exactly that way. Uh, but but I also think that until very recently, they haven't uh, done a particularly good job of of showing that they don't need that kind of regulation of of, of sort of self-regulating. Um, but but I think you know those kinds of solutions are are only going to help on the margin anyway because the the project here is is bigger. It's about fostering a, a discussion, not just on one platform or anything else, but allowing, you know, Biden outlined that challenge when he when he talked about how you know, disagreement doesn't have to lead to disunity. And and I don't know that I have an answer to how you get the current Amer American election from, from the place it's in now to that world that he's talking about, which is one that most of us in Western democracies have understood that we live in for, for generations, but suddenly seems really threatened in the United States. Well, David Frum has had some thoughts about that, and I'm going to read some of them. Here's what he wrote earlier this week on the day of the inauguration. He wrote, Trump's was a government of the crooks, by the crooks, and for the crooks. How on earth did this brazen and shameless practitioner of sleaze, verging upon crime, ever sell the idea that he was somehow struggling against sleaze? And David, I put that quote out there for the record. You're still a very good writer, I have to say. That's very well put. But, but I, I do want to know whether or not, four years later, you are any clearer in your own mind about why 74 million people ultimately decided to vote for Trump and were not as concerned, as you clearly were, about his manifest crookedness. Well, I, I agree they are a heterogeneous bunch, and 74 million people had a lot of different reasons for voting. Um, but I also, I, I, I want to just insist, I, I think when we look at the 74 million, um, we are looking at the wrong question. The right question is there are 81 million people who voted against all of this. Um, and yet the American political system treats this decisive majority. Um, Biden won a big majority. He won 52% of the country. Donald Trump won 46%. Um, Trump has, Donald Trump was the historically the most unpopular first-term president in the history of polling. Uh, of, since in the 21st century, there have been 12 major party nominees for president, starting with uh, Bush versus Gore in the year 2000. Um, of those 12, Donald Trump's stand finished 10th and 11th in his share of the national vote. And so the question is, why is somebody who is so rejected, why does he have such decisive hold on power? And the answer well, we're going to find that answer not by psychoanalyzing the 74 million or the hardcore of the 74 million. We're going to find the answer by saying, why is it that those 74 million count for so much more than the 81 million who voted the other way? Why is it, for example, that in a state like Wisconsin, 45 percent of the people get 65 percent of the seats in the state legislature? And, and so instead of psychoanalyzing the anti-democratic elements in the society, you need to fortify the society against those anti-democratic elements. And the answer to that is by increasing the amount of majority rule in the American political system, not psychoanalysis. I hear what you're saying. But on the other hand, if, if, the, if the message from the president this week is we have to reach across and see if we can find any common ground with that 74 million, I'm going to... I'm going to nudge another question here. Michelle, let's, let's go... You and I do this one together. White supremacy. How much of that is an explanation behind why 74 million people voted for Trump? 
Far more than I wish, actually. There clearly is still a very prominent uh, amount of white supremacy in America. Some of it is actually, though, out a kind of fear of what people who are white sometimes think they're losing. I don't think everybody who has signed on to this particular variety of white supremacy in the current moment. I don't think they're actually all died in the wool racists. I think they are fearful. I think they're the, the world of work has changed. So globalization and the increased automation of work has led to the disappearance of jobs that people could, you know, take for granted. You didn't have to have a PhD or a college degree to be able to put food on the table and with one job, you would have health care benefits, you would have a possibility of a you know decent retirement, and people are feeling uncertain. They're feeling the decent people who've been drawn into this. They feel that this is something which will save them against a set of changes in the world they don't think they can control. And sadly, I mean, I, I understand David's concern about fortifying the majority, but if you don't listen to some of the people in the minority who in some cases had actually voted for Obama in the, in the election before Trump, why did that group that had been in support of Obama thinking he would help them why did they switch allegiance so quickly and so dramatically? And this is not about trying to say that their interests matter more, but their interests matter. And frankly, when the world of work has changed as badly as it has in America, and Joe Biden now being said to have inherited the worst job market wow. maybe ever in modern American history, you white people, black people, Asian people, you know, Hispanic people, everybody is feeling the strain of changes in economic life and not knowing what to do for it. And if we don't address it without talking about race, but talking about rejuvenating the economy, whatever that takes to do it in a way that's constructive, we will not save America. American democracy will not survive unless we address the things we suffer in common. David, I should give you a chance to come back on that. Um, I, look, I agree that the concerns of minorities are all also always important, of course, and and uh, there are many things that we can do, and I've, I've written about them, and the, the last half of the last book I wrote was all about how you offer, build highways to bring people back uh, into the national community, and I, I've talked about steps like, um, you know, uh, creating stronger national programs and um, re restricting immigration flows, um, uh, focusing, thinking very hard about how you bring work to rural America and not just how you bring rural America to the cities, all of those kinds of questions. But in the end, the reason we have this crisis right now is because, um, and the reason we have the crisis on January 6th is because the 46 percent thought it was a feasible, or the leaders of the 46%, or the most extreme elements of the 46%, thought it was a feasible project to use violence to control the country. Um, and they need to be made to understand that is not a feasible project. Um, it is not going to work. Um, and any hope you might, and of course it wasn't going to work, but any hope you had that the door is just completely debarred. And the way you gain power is by building functioning majorities. And that, since 2000, since the great gerrymander of 2011, um, it has really seemed possible to uh, engineer minority rule in America. And that possibility, we have to close the door on that. Ed, I wonder if in your travels and as you talk to people in the United States, do you get a sense that, that there are many people out there that actually want to share deeper fraternity and sorority with one another outside of their echo chambers? Oh. Hmm. Uh, yeah, when you ask them directly, and actually even when you don't ask them directly, when you ask them about how they're feeling about the country, how they're feeling about the state of politics, I found people in rural Pennsylvania and downtown Philadelphia both said that they were uh, upset and distressed by a, a state of politics where they felt like they couldn't talk to their neighbors anymore. Uh, without starting a fight. Uh, Trump voters in suburban Pittsburgh told me that, you know, they're worried that if they were quoted by name, they'd be fired from their jobs. Uh, people, uh, you know, sometimes rightly uh, in cities were telling me that they thought Republicans were a threat of severe violence. And, and we saw in Washington, D.C., uh, the insurrectionists, maybe uh, many of them weren't far from that. So, I mean, the people I talk to, they bring up independently a desire to have uh, a less uh, less openly hostile, bitter, uh, divisive, violent politics. 
Um, and yet they would have different diagnoses of where the problem is, right? There's a there's a whole bunch of Republicans and Trump supporters who think that cancel culture and, and Black Lives Matter are the ones who are posing a threat to any kind of open, reasonable dialogue. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I think that there's many more people who voted in this election, uh, as David keeps pointing out, a majority of Americans who are realizing that that it, it's it's not necessarily it's not them who's the problem that that the, the people who won't accept a loss in election who are going to insist that they won who are going to insist that a majority try to change uh, try, try to overturn the election and in fact the institutions of the Republican Party for some time now have been trying to engineer situations where they can permanently win with a majority um, you, you know that that's an obstacle too so when you when you Outright ask the question, uh, do we want more bipartisanship? Do we want more unity? People say yes. But when you start talking about how to solve that problem of disunity, uh, they are more disunited than ever. Hmm. Well, let's consider then what, after four years of Trumpism, needs to be repaired in terms of American democracy. Because if we've heard this expression once, we've all probably heard it a hundred times. One thing Trump did was take down the guardrails that were normally there to prevent leaders from going too far out over their skis. There's another political expression we probably should retire as well. Uh, Michelle, start us off here. Let us consider what needs repairing after four years of Trump. What's on your list? The list is long. I mean, one of them is we need to now start thinking that civic sacrifice, so people who fight in war, but people who are out on the front lines in hospitals and in intensive care units, their sacrifice matters. It's sacrifice for the common good, and that needs to be celebrated. I said earlier that I thought shared suffering needed to be acknowledged, and we need to be able to get to a moment where we don't say that government's intrinsically a bad thing, when sometimes government action is the only way to meet the needs of shared suffering. Franklin Roosevelt said this, the very last uh, speech he gave as governor of New York, he said, we're going to have to change the way we think about the action of government. And so changing the way we think about government is not intrinsically bad. But also, I, I'm going to go back to the point about reshaping communication. The word communication comes from the idea of sharing something, making something common. And we have allowed our media, I'm not talking about government regulation, I think I was misinterpreted there, for somebody to sit down with the heads of these corporations, to sit down with Mark Zuckerberg, who, by the way, right, shut down some of these um, conspiracy theories during the, the worst of the violence we were seeing, they understand that if America cannot find ways to communicate, A, truthfully, but also, B, in a way that acknowledges we have common Thing, we have things in common that are valuable. We will not have American democracy any longer. It depends upon the willingness to sacrifice to wear a mask in public. I mean, people who will wear shoes and shirts somehow find it, un, you know, they're unable to say, I'll wear a mask. That's a sacrifice. But we need a culture that reminds people again of why identity in a democracy, shared common self-understanding is sometimes rooted in our appreciation and respect for sacrifice that people make for the common good. David, in your view, what gates for political bad behavior that were opened over the last four years need closing? Um, here's the one I would do first, um, and it's not exactly the most important, but it's got powerful symbolic power. Um, I think we need to see state and federal laws that absolutely prohibit, on penalty of a very serious prison sentence, the carrying of a firearm by anyone other than a peace officer within 500 yards of a government building or polling place. Um, the habit of brandishing weapons um, near, uh, near government buildings has really spread over the past decade, and especially in the Trump years, we saw what happened. People brought firearms into the Mich Michigan legislature. There are firearms present at the Capitol. 500 yards limit and around polling places, too. Um, now, that will be a hard measure to pass, but it's a good fight to have because it 
it drives home the point that you're facing really a challenge of violence um, and that the people who are insisting on their right to intimidate, which is what these weapons are, um, that they need to, you need to find, find a way to pick an argument with them over something that isolates them as forces of violence and a ban on firearms in the vicinity of government buildings and polling places would be the fight to have. Is it a good idea, let me follow up, David, is it a good idea for a new president whose currency is really hot right now, really good right now, is it useful for him to use some of that currency on a battle which even you admit he's probably going to lose? The heavy lifting on this would be done by governors anyway, um, because most, most of the relevant laws are state laws. Most of the polling, polling places are run by the states, not by the federal government. Um, but yeah, I think this would be a very good argument for Governor Whitmer in Michigan to have and other governors as well. Hmm. Okay. I wonder, let's, let's have a bit of a chat about this now. Ed, you can start us off on this. I wonder how America is going to come closer together and how we can build some of those highways you talked about, David, uh, earlier in our discussion, when there is so much invested in continuing, as the president called it, the uncivil war. Cable television thrives on the uncivil war. Talk radio thrives on the uncivil war. Political fundraisers thrive on the uncivil war. How can you end an uncivil war when so many people are invested in it continuing? Ed, go. Well, I mean, I think, and this, this may sound like a, a pipe dream, but I think uh, what you saw from some of the establishment of the Republican Party in the in the inauguration uh, and in, in the time since the siege of the Capitol um, was a kind of a pullback from what David's identifying as as not not people who disagree on policy, but people who disagree on, on the appropriateness of violence as a solution to that, that that's too far over the line, that there are insurrectionists and racists and extremists who, who are trying to reject the whole system. And so I think um, you you might be able to, and public polling is showing uh, you know, the drop in support for Donald Trump after the election, you, you can bring a, a bigger chunk, and we're not talking about 100% of the population, but a sizable majority on board to the idea that, that they still maybe believe in democracy, in the peaceful uh, processes of democracy. And then, and then I think, uh, you also try to focus on common projects uh, that that are more broadly popular across the spectrum, and maybe uh, that that is economic measures. Maybe that is uh, you know finally quashing the pandemic. But you know nothing succeeds like success. And if if you can, uh, if 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 part of this is that people are feeling left out, or like their concerns aren't being addressed, or that. Uh, society is somehow marginalizing them. Uh, maybe dealing with that in in the ways that are more popular uh, and and less openly hostile uh, lowers the temperature a little bit. Michelle, what's your view on that? Yeah, I think it's going to be very important to be honest in our legal processes about what it means to confront the kind of violence we saw on uh, January 6th. The people who've been arrested for the various charges, for everything from conspiracy, you know, to w the other charges they've been brought up on, they need to be convicted and they need to serve time. Uh, and I think unless we do that, it looks as though we're not serious about trying to say violence is not you know, a way to lead your life. If you value democratic institutions, we're going to have to uh, put our institutional practices where our values are. David, Rush Limbaugh wears the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That says something. How do we end this uncivil war when apparently millions of Americans think it's completely appropriate that he have that medal around his neck? Um. Yeah, no, that, that was a pretty shameful moment. I, I, there's a part of me that thinks it's time to start a new um, a new medal and to like um, call the Presidential Medal of Freedom like the bronze and now create a new goal that you actually give to people who in some way contribute to making the country better rather than ma making it making it worse. Um, I do think that, there, that Donald Trump is going to become a kind of pariah in politics. And his his act of willfulness of not showing at the inauguration is going to make it easier and easier to separate him um, from, you know, as, as Joe Biden said in his inaugural, one of the most, I, I thought, effective moments at the inaugural, he re referenced the presidents of both parties behind him, greeted them as patriots. And then he alluded to that there were two presidents not there. One was Jimmy Carter, who was not there because of his great age. And he mentioned that he had telephoned President Carter and had, and then, and Donald Trump was just sort of being excised, and um, 
he is going to draw, drag along with him to infamy all the people who got too close to him. And one of the things that has been very interesting, I've had uh, pinned atop my Twitter feed for the past two years a prediction that when all of this is over, nobody will admit to having supported it. And you can begin to see many people in all kinds of walks of life who were close to Donald Trump now saying, well, w w I wasn't for him exactly. Um, and that's often a fiction, but it's a, it's a useful fiction that he is going – and as he shuffles off – and to the margin, he will pull the Limbaugh's away with him. Uh, it is it is important to remember to put. Uh, and as we have a more representative political system, we will see how much of a minority this really was. We have been through a period of mi minority rule, and all of these expeditions to diners. You know, I, I remember um, somebody doing a um, a story from a jurisdiction, interviewing a bunch of people in a town in Ohio, and. Um, and they, you know, they were solid for Trump. And you look up the population of this town, and the town had a smaller population than the um, uh, neighborhood of Westwood in the immediate vicinity of the University of uh, uh, UCLA, UC, University of California, in Los Angeles, all of Luzerne County, uh, the area around uh, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, that got so much attention uh, in uh, from so many reporters over uh, years since 2016. That has a population less than Manhattan, south of Washington Square Park. Uh, so, rediscovering the country, rediscovering real America. Uh, the re the real, real America, the America that lives in cities, the America that invents new technologies, the America that writes songs, uh, the America that produces 70 percent of the country's wealth, that America, rediscover them and sh hold up a mirror to them and let them see, you know, there are a lot more of you than there are of even the, uh, than, than there are of these reactionary elements, especially of the most violent reactionary elements. Well, let me ask uh, Michelle about that America. Is it possible that America is just too vast, too various? for its own good and simply can't contain this much diversity. I actually do not believe that. And I'm somebody, I'm not, I mean, I do fly a lot, but I also, my husband and I drive uh, to Chicago frequently from New York City. So I drive through those towns in Pennsylvania. I eat in the little local restaurants there and stay in the motel. And I will tell you, there are good people in those towns. You can assume that some of the people there are kind of out of the mainstream, but they don't all want the world to crash around them or around us. They want solutions. And I think the danger, I, I hear a little bit in David's commentary, a kind of flyover mentality. We can't just write them off. We can't write anybody off. There might be innovation somewhere in a little town in Pennsylvania. It's not all going to come from Manhattan. I mean, I'm. this is where I am. But you have to assume that the variety of America, the heterogeneity, actually is part of the energy that has, when it's worked well, that has made it such a wonderful place to be. I still love America. I am troubled and worried. I mean, I was in mourning, actually, January 7th and 8th for several for several hours. Would we survive? But the things that will make us survive will be reinvigorating, renewing the best of America wherever you might find it. And it might be in a little town in Pennsylvania, and it might be on Central Park West uh, or on Broadway in, in Manhattan. We don't know. Hmm. And I don't want to make too big a deal of this, but the fact is there was a PBS lawyer who was fired for being caught on tape celebrating the rise of COVID-19 in red states because he said that would depress the Trump vote and suggesting what America needs right now really are some re-education camps for the kids of Trump supporters so that they could be sort of brought away from the dark side and over to the bright side. I wonder whether some progressive people out there really do have to get a grip right now. Uh, well, sure. I mean, <laughs> th th there are going to be people who say uh, deeply insensitive things out of a sense of schadenfreude on both sides. And there are going to be, to some extent, extremists on both sides. But I think uh, to the extent that you talk about having a productive democratic conversation and repairing democracy and unity of some kind, I, I think it's, it's – uh, part of the key is, is not catering to the extremes of both sides and not holding them out those people in diners uh, who are openly racist or who believe in uh, bizarre conspiracy theories, n not not holding them out as, as the person you have to persuade to get anything done. At a certain point, there's a, a broad swath of middle uh, in all of America, whether you go to the small towns and whether you go to the big cities. Um, and, and those are what, you know, pol politicos traditionally call like persuadable voters. That's where you focus your efforts on. And, and I think uh, elevating uh, 
the sort of broad center, peaceful, democratic debating center of America to the to the the middle of the conversation, central in the conversation, rather than trying to figure out what uh, mis- what, what set of slogans and or policies will win over the most extreme elements of either side. Um, I mean, that that polarization that has pushed uh, politics to uh, talking to the most extreme voices is to some extent what's caused, you know, things to become more bitter and bitter and bitter. Mm-hmm. Saying that may be easier than doing it, but... Mm-hmm. Let me give the last minute to David here, and it's on really the question that official Washington now has to deal with, the very um, difficult and uncomfortable question about whether it's going to be easier to reach across to the other side, and I appreciate your views on that, but whether it will be easier if now that Trump is twice impeached, he is convicted in the Senate, or should they let it go? What's your view on that? Well, um, you, you shouldn't let it go, but you also have to understand that he is not going to be convicted in the Senate. So America needs to find a way forward. It needs to find a way to indelibly mark what Donald Trump did as as an unacceptable disgrace, a unique disgrace, a former president, our president, in raising insurrection against his own government, against his own vice president, but also understanding that the the forces of partisanship make it difficult to bring real justice. So how do we find a way to reinforce democratic norms, accepting that justice is not going to be done? That's a great question. And maybe that's the focus of a future episode of this wonderful partnership we have with the Toronto Star, the uh, Democracy Agenda. We're so glad to have the three of you on for our first installment of this. David Frum, the staff writer for The Atlantic. Uh, Edward Keenan, the Washington Bureau Chief of the Toronto Star. They're both in Washington. Michelle Moody Adams, Columbia University in New York City. Thanks so much to all three of you and take good care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. And we should just add, the democracy agenda continues in two weeks' time. We'll be hosting these conversations every other Thursday for the remainder of our season. The democracy agenda is a joint initiative between TVO and the Toronto Star. And you can also check out my column in today's Star. All of Ontario is under a stay-at-home order to help combat this pandemic. For tenants and landlords, that makes the stakes in disputes both new and ongoing higher than ever. Mary Baxter covers the southwestern part of the province for Ontario Hubs. She's been looking at how those disagreements are being resolved amid COVID and joins us now from London. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jan. It's good to be here. Now, enforcement on eviction orders have halted for now but hearings are still going on. How has Ontario's board that adjudicates the disputes between tenants and landlords sort of shifted and uh, kind of pivoted during uh, the pandemic? Well, pre-pandemic, uh, the, the the landlord and tenant board uh, would hear cases, the adjudicator would hear cases in person. So that meant actually traveling to a specific area and and hearing a whole batch of cases uh, during during a day or a couple of days of hearings. Uh, and I, of course, we had the pandemic, we had social distancing, and uh, that became quite unsafe to do. So I, first off, the the, the, the board was uh, suspended for, for a while uh, as we were all uh, um, ordered to basically stay home. Uh, and, and then it came back with a digital presence. So that means just like you might contact somebody on Zoom, that's how you would actually hear your hearing is, is, is via video conference or you could call in and uh, in special cases perhaps even write in. Why did uh, the Landlord and Tenant Board find it so important to keep uh, these hearings going? Well, they weren't going for quite a while. So as they weren't going, uh, during that time as well, there was a moratorium on evictions. But that was all lifted at the beginning of August, which meant that there was a whole uh, backlog of cases uh, to be heard, plus the cases that were scheduled when uh, everything was suspended. So they wanted to find a way to uh, uh, be able to deal with the, the backlog in an efficient manner. But they also wanted something that they felt might be accessible. And and that's, those are basically the reasons why. Now you spoke to Shauna Moorhead, Moorhead rather, of the Grey Bruce Community Legal Clinic about some of the challenges 
with virtual hearing. Let's have a look at what she had to say. We have many concerns when the Landlord and Tenant Board moved to digital hearings. Our main concern, though, is around access to justice. When they move to uh, digital hearings, they require a tenant to have access to the internet, a computer, and the knowledge to know how to use it to access their um, hearing. Now, there is a telephone option for tenants to call in as well. However, we still have concerns as many tenants may not have um, adequate time on their cell phone. They may have very poor signal of uh, where they're living, especially in uh, rural and remote areas. And many tenants don't even have a cell phone to call in. Now, for your article on TVO.org, you also spoke to some tenants. How are they dealing with some, some of those specific challenges? Uh, one of the tenants that I spoke to was uh, Ashton Kearney, who uh, was living in um, uh, Walkerton, uh, and uh, she was notified of her hearing via email. It was in in November, and it was it was in plenty of time. But as Ashton says, it was really lucky that uh, first off she had email. And uh, secondly, that she regularly checks her email because the the notice actually said that there would be uh, um, a notice via paper that would be mailed out to her, but it actually didn't arrive until uh, the the deadline for filing the evidence for her case uh, had passed. And it came in a manila envelope that, uh, you know, she, she thought was maybe like an Amazon package. There just wasn't enough information to distinguish what it was. So from there, uh, she got to her hearing, and uh, she actually did manage to file her uh, evidence. And when I'm talking about evidence, I'm talking about things like uh, photographs of uh, how the apartment was being maintained or not being maintained, uh, any receipts of uh, expenses that she she shouldered that maybe she felt that the landlord should have shouldered, that sort of thing. Uh, so she, she gathered all this into a package. She had to digitize everything, make sure it was digitized, and get it filed for the adjudicator rolls around to the day of the hearing and uh, she's there uh, as are a number of people to to wait and hear their cases and she discovers that the adjudicator never received her documents so then there was this just this 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 scramble to uh, try to refile them with the adjudicator she couldn't get them so then her lawyer had to do it uh, and uh, then the adjudicator had to take time to be able to review the documents and on top of that it pushed her back in the hearing file. So she had to wait while she heard other people's cases unfold. What I'm hearing is a lot of frustration. I understand that you actually spoke to a lawyer who uh, shared some of those stories. One that kind of talked about uh, Shauna's example of, you know, people not having access to the internet, but uh, do have access to the phones, but that's necessarily not the easiest. Yes, I spoke to Jamie Hildebrand. He's the uh, executive director of uh, the Huron Perth Community Legal Clinic. And he was telling me about one of his clients who had to use a payphone because his, that, that client didn't have access even to a landline. So had to walk into town, use the, the payphone. The day that it, uh, this happened, it was really cold and it started to rain. And uh, Jamie says that he could actually hear this fellow's teeth chattering in the call and they were waiting again waiting and waiting for the hearing to come up and i uh, finally the, the the fellow just said you know i can't stand this and he hung up i want to bring in another clip of shauna moorhead uh this is where she's talking about solutions uh let's have a look at that i believe it's incumbent upon the ontario government and the tri tri tribunals of Ontario to provide the access to justice for tenants and even small landlords and other landlords to access their hearing. Um, so to provide the technology such as a, a hearing site where tenants can go to, so they can uh, use a computer with reliable internet, uh, be able to fully participate in the video hearing, um, and then to have someone there to help um, deal with any kind of technology challenges that may come up um, in terms of during that hearing. Um, such as trying to submit documents during the hearing and to make sure that their side of the story is fully heard and they feel that justice being, is being done by our justice system. You know, you highlight a number of the challenges uh, with these virtual hearings. So it's no surprise that there's been a lot of no-shows. Um, are there any implications for those tenants going forward? Or are there any penalties if they aren't able to make them? 
Well, consider that uh, for for many tenants, when it reaches this kind of stage, uh, the other circumstances that they may be in, they can't pay their rent because they simply don't have the money. So where do they go from there? They can go to the street. They can go to a shelter. Maybe they can find you know a place to to stay with with a friend or someone that they know. Uh, but then on top of that, you know, uh, landlords there there are land there are websites that uh, provide landlords uh, the ability to be able to list bad tenants. So for these people, if they start to get on their feet, the challenge also becomes, you know, how how can they rent from someone else when everybody knows that they had this experience where they didn't pay rent? It's very, very interesting. Of course, some, a story that we will continue to cover. Mary Baxter, I want to thank you so much. That's Mary Baxter, Ontario Hub journalist covering Southwestern Ontario. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. The agenda this week assessed progress on the calls to action five years on from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's capstone report. Gabrielle, where do you come down on that question of whether you believe the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has essentially achieved its mission? I feel that the TRC did everything that they needed to do, everything that they wanted to do in order to achieve reconciliation. However, I do believe that reconciliation is ultimately the responsibility of Canadians. It is not up to Indigenous people to repair the harms that Canadians have done to Indigenous peoples. And right now, what we're seeing is that the burden is falling on the shoulders of Indigenous people, and that's just not fair. Um, a lot of young people that I work with actually believe that reconciliation is dead. And that's what they say. Reconciliation is dead. And that's not to take away any of the work that the TRC has done or that survivors have done, but that's a reflection on the Canadian government. We will surely come back to that comment because that's a very that's a very stark way to describe where things are at today. So uh, to be sure, Gabrielle, we'll come back on that. I wanted to give you three a chance to, to weigh in first and now um, batting cleanup, if I can put it that way. Clayton Shirt, you're the elder among us here. Let's get your view on this. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to say, I, just say I, I, I don't consider myself an elder. I'm just, I'm just elderly, I guess. Uh, I'm getting <laughs> old. Um, that's the title they've given me and uh, everything, but uh, I don't really recognize myself as an elder. That's that's a, my community. They do that. So with that, but I was just saying, I was just thinking about when they came here a few years ago. Truth, uh, the the commission came and they, we we sat in um, Queens Park, and I was part of that. I was uh, doing a pipe ceremony there, and. We did the ceremony, and um, and all the ministers, everybody was there, um, and it was part of it. And so as they traveled, it was it was a, it was really something to see, and it, and I was amazed, and I was very uh, happy to be there, but I knew that this was just the beginning of the beginning, and and I and, and to just say that um, it's really important to keep this conversation going because that's all it is it's just nothing's been done let's the, there's that's the reality nothing has been done if that was the beginning and of the beginning where do you think we are right now we're not even we're still there we're still trying to have that conversation and we need and it's so and, and i and i get the youth i get their frustration and but i it's uh, it's with us, what we're trying to do and what I'm trying to do and other people is to keep that conversation alive. That's all. Hmm. It's up to them to take that responsibility and to say, OK, and to have that conversation and keep it alive. Because in the reality of all of this, nothing has been ever done yet. Right. When it comes to those 94 recommendations and all of this. And so when I talk to when I talk to so many people and, and not native and non-native and all of this, they, they you know, this government and all the other governments are going to come and go. They all see they always like to write a report. Right. And they had in Canada has a history of writing reports and then they, they put it on a shelf. Right. And then they tell the people that and then they give this illusion that they give the, to the people, the citizens 
all of these things that we did something about this. And so they, they mislead their own people and saying to them, look, we did something. And I get this conversation with them all the time. They said, hey, didn't we do something about this? All right. No. You well, just, they let's just wrote go, a report. Forgive me. Let's so go through some of this then if we can. Yeah. And, and um, well, let me just remind everybody, there were, there were uh, a number of general areas that the TRC recommendations tried to focus on. Education, language and culture, and child welfare, health, justice, reconciliation. Gabrielle, we will come back to that. Uh, Pamela, you're, um, you're a lawyer, so let's start with justice. What needs to be done immediately today to make Indigenous people in Canada think, hmm, we've made some progress on justice? Uh, and genocide. I mean, it's as simple as that. It means clear out the prisons, which are stuffed with Indigenous peoples. That, in, that includes youth corrections. I mean, the fastest growing prison population is little Indigenous girls. Some of the youth correction centres are 98% Indigenous girls. We need to clear out group homes and foster homes and keep Indigenous children with their families. You know, we need to make sure that all Indigenous people are housed. They have the basics like clean drinking water. The fact that I'm talking to you about clean drinking water seems surreal. And so I think when we're talking about reconciliation, that's where we need to go on the ground, dealing with things like murder to missing Indigenous women and girls. When we talk about things like a legislative amendment here, a policy change here, an apology over here, that's all at the high superficial political level. It's not at the ground where the people are. And I would welcome any politician from any level of government to walk into an urban center like Winnipeg, downtown Winnipeg, in a pandemic in the winter and take a look at all the Indigenous peoples there and say, we're making progress on reconciliation. And that's literally how stark it is. This is literally about life and death. It's, it shouldn't be in this political realm that it is. Jennifer, I want to start with you because it's been five years since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action came out, and I want to know, in your view, whether or not you think it has led to greater justice for Indigenous peoples in this country. Not by a long shot, unfortunately. We still have so much work to do. Not by a long shot, you say, but can you say that the yardsticks are at least moving? I would say that in some areas the yardsticks are moving, and I'm seeing education to young people starting to move. I think that it's going to take a long time and a couple of generations yet to actually educate everybody to the point that they understand what the injustices are. John Moskowitz, in your view, well, let me, let me set it up this way. You, you represent a people that have been through their share of historical trauma. Can a five-year-old report with um, many recommendations still incomplete can that help heal a community? Not in the least. Uh, this is not about a five-year-old report. This is about a recovery from trauma uh, imposed by the government of Canada on the indigenous nations of, uh, of the country. And it will take um, a great deal of education, as Jennifer said, a great deal of time, uh, recovery of a culture, and the acknowledgement, as you're suggesting, of the trauma. Do you have a sense about, as you look through history, about how long it takes for that mission to be accomplished? Every culture is, is different. Look, my people, the Jews, were in uh, exile after the destruction of the temple for the better part of 2,000 years. Um, we were able to sustain because learning sustained and family sustained uh, in exile. That's not necessarily the case with First Nations. Uh, families were separated. Education was um, farmed out to government schools. It's, much, it's going to be much harder. There is no full healing. There is no full recovery, but there can be recovery. It does take time. It takes courage, and it takes uh, the support of the Canadian people and the government. Raymond D'Souza, we live in a Western-style country that, uh, when it sees a problem, tends to appoint a commission and write a study. And we do that for a lot of different issues, and we've done it many, many times on this issue as well. In your view, can we make progress taking that approach? 
Well, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you're right, it's one of several commissions. Uh, in terms of practical steps, when you go through the recommendations, there's a lot to be done. But I think unusually for government commissions, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission actually did change in a significant way how things are discussed and talked about. The uh, sesquicentennial of the country in 2015, 2017, pardon me, was quite a bit different. Um, public ceremonies around the country are different. The namings of buildings at my university, Queen's University, you had a program about the Sir John A. Macdonald Law School. Uh, so actually, I think that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, in terms of practical steps of improved livelihoods for Indigenous Canadians, uh, may be lacking, as has been pointed out. But in terms of changing the conversation and how people think about Canada, Canada's history, it's had actually, I would say, a quite an unusually large impact for a government report. And that is just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, you can visit our website, that's tvo.org, our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, January 22nd, 2021. Next week, in collaboration with the Rural Ontario Municipal Association for its annual conference, we'll find out how this pandemic has reverberated in farming communities, for students, and in efforts at economic development beyond the big cities. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you back here again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.